Hello family! Hope everybody's having a wonderful time at this year's reunion. Sorry we couldn't be there, but I'm thankful for this opportunity um, to be able to be somewhat part of this. So I'm just going to jump straight into the video. This year for Mother's Day, Matt surprised me with this gift. And I, I covered the address just because this video is going on YouTube. But it's a stamp uh, with our house address for a new house. And when I opened it, I, I stared at this picture for a good 10 minutes. And Matt was getting worried. He said, oh no, you don't like it. And I said, oh no, I do. Is this a coat of arms? And he said, yes. And he went on to explain to me how there is this wooden plate with a Kunzer coat of arms and it was brought over from Switzerland. So of course my Indiana Jones mode kicked in and started doing this research. And so today I, I wanna share my findings, what I discovered and um, hopefully you'll find this interesting. I thought I loved it, it was so much fun. And I, I hope you guys like what I found and what I discovered. For this video, I kind of want to take you guys through my process of how I went about researching this. I'm, gonna, I'm also going to try to not go into too much detail, um, just so you don't get too bored. A coat of arms, um, another word for it is heraldry. And so coat of arms, they came, um, we first start seeing them in the Middle Ages, um, I would say um, in the mid 12th century. And they, they started off as identification. And what I mean by that is um, we first see them with knights. Now, knights on the battlefield um, from both sides, they're, they're, everybody's wearing the metal armor, the iron armor, and it's kind of hard to be able to tell who's who and uh, who you should be fighting. And so, knights started wearing surcoats on top of their armor and they started having banners and shields and putting their symbols, their coat of arms on top of their surcoats, their banners and their shields so that their soldiers could be able to tell them apart on the battlefield. And even their soldiers would wear sometimes the surcoat as well so you could tell who's who and who's on your side. So actually, um, I know the movies, they, they show a that you know in the middle ages the battlefield was just gray and silver but it was actually really colorful grim but colorful um <laughs> so that's where a coat of arms comes from it's from that surcoat that uh, was able to identify the knights first of all first it was knights and kings who who had this uh, coat of arms but then nobles started to get into the game and nobles started to have their own coat of arms and used it specifically um, well, not specifically, but they, but they would use it during their tournaments. You know, when they do when they would do their games, uh, they also would wear the surcoats and have the banners and their shields, and that's when it became popular, and it just kind of took on from there. Part of the reason why I wanted to do even more research about uh, this coat of arms was for authenticity, and um, I hope you don't get offended with this. A lot of a lot of people today, and I've done the same thing, and I'm sure a lot of you have done the same thing, but you, a lot of people think that you can just go on the internet, type in your last name, and then whatever pops up, that coat of arms is your family's coat of arms. But that is not the case. A coat of arms, it, it doesn't come just from surnames. Arms can only be passed in a legitimate male line. Uh, from parent to child. So that's what kind of started this whole um, research because I, I wanted to see if it was a legitimate coat of arms. Hope you guys don't mind. But I think you'll like my findings. So like I said at the beginning of this video, I want to take you guys through my process, uh, through my research, how, how I went through and the steps I took. So first, of course, I went through the different elements. So just to give you a brief review, a brief uh, coat of arms 101. Um, a coat of arms, it, uh, 
there needs to be specific elements for it to be a complete heraldic achievement or a complete coat of arms. It can't just be a shield, then it's it's not a coat of arms. It, it has to have these different elements together to be a complete set. And that's what the Kunzer, the, the Kunzer coat of arms is a complete set. Now, in a coat of arms, there's a crest, a wreath, helmets, mantles and as well as a shield now there are some that do have a motto but that's not a necessity to be a complete heretic achievement the first thing um, that i noticed from the the stamp was the helmet it was actually kind of funny because matt had never known that that was a helmet he thought that was the body and the blob was the head but it is a helmet and the helmet, the position of the helmet, it does tell us a lot. Uh, it has a lot of meaning behind it. So with a helmet, if, if the helmet is facing forward and the visor is open, it means that it's a knight. But if the visor, if the helmet is facing sideways and the visor is closed, that means it's a gentleman or nobleman. So the Kunzer coat of arms is a gentleman, not a knight, but a gentleman. Next, you have the wreath, and the wreath is actually, so the wreath is, right, is placed right on top of the helmet and is actually connected to the mantles. And this is really cool because they actually used to do this in battle. Knights, they would have these pieces, pieces of silk attached to their helmet, and that's what that wreath is, is twisted pieces of silk. That comes out like this and uh, during uh, the battle uh, knights would have this connected to their helmets not only to help them protect them from the elements but it also used a it was also a useful purpose during battle and what I mean by elements is you have to think they're they're um, it's entirely made out of metal of iron and that can get rusty with rain and all of that so it would help them with protecting their armor and might have also helped them keep cool a little bit. I don't know how much, but maybe a little bit. But also, it could help you fighting an opponent um, during battle. So you had the silk flaying around and you're fighting your opponent and if your opponent had a spear or a sword, if it got caught in your silk, it would get caught in it and it would give you that moment just to, whoosh, to defeat your opponent. So on coat of arms, every time you see mantles, they're always, it's always shredded because it shows that you were in battle and you, you fought and all of that. So that's why if, if you were going to get a coat of arms, you wanted that silk to be shredded, to, you know, cause it's cooler. And that's what the concert coat of arms is. It's shredded pieces of silk that are tied to the helmet. I guess I'll go into the colors. So when I look at the coat of arms, I notice two specific colors is blue and silver. And from all of my research, from all the different sources I saw, it's not a debated thing with uh, the meanings behind the colors. Everybody says the same things. So for the blue, that means truth and loyalty and the silver is for peace and sincerity. Oh, I guess I forgot the crest. And the crest is what sits on top of the helmet. Now, unfortunately, I just, I can't tell what that blob is. To me, it is just a blob. I have done, I have tried to find the meaning behind the ship. I just can't find that shape anywhere. So. Maybe I just need a fresh set of eyes on it. So if any of you, if that blob looks like something, let me know to you. But I'm not sure about that blob. And it might have been lost into translation later on with the heralds and um, their description of the coat of arms. But that's the one thing I, I haven't been able to figure out is that blob. So if any of you have anything on that, let me know, please. So that blob is part of the crest, and if you see on top of the blob, I'm saying blob a lot, but if you look on top of it, there is a plume of feathers. And a plume of feathers, that is a sign of willing obedience and serenity of mind. Now, the last 
parts, the last element of the Consort coat of arms is the shield. And the, this stumped me. It stumped me, um, the symbol on this shield. Um, I had a hard time figuring that out, but I figured it out. With my research, I read this book. It was written, I think, in 1905 by Arthur Charles Fox Davies. It was very useful, but I'll never read it again. But it was really good, and it helped me figure it out. So he goes into details of the different elements of coat of arms and um, throughout all of, mostly England, but, but a lot of uh, throughout Europe. He went through the different shapes of shields. And so to me, it looks like this one. And according to him, that shape, it derives from Germany in the later half of the 15th century. So that's old, guys. That's really old. Late, the later half of the 15th century. And it makes sense. According to your family history, um, you know, with Switzerland, and um, it makes sense because uh, Switzerland was part of the Holy Roman Empire till uh, they gained their independence uh, was until 14. 99 but they were part of the holy roman empire so it makes sense it makes sense that it's germanic a shield is actually the most important part of a coat of arms and because it tells us a lot especially the symbols behind it tells us a lot about that person in that family and what they did and all of that now with shields i'm just gonna quote from the book a shield crowded with quarterings is interesting in as much as each quartering in the ordinary event means the representation through a female of some other family or branch thereof. So a lot of shields that we see today, they have quarterings and that just means that that's the female line. So it's not a direct male line, but it's a female line because females, they could take part of their family shield and bring it to their new family. Um, you know, kind of like, uh, I know a lot of Americans, they, they choose not to give their daughters uh, middle names just so that when they get married, then they still have their last name within their name. It's kind of like that. So to continue, he says, but the real value of such a shield should be judged rather by the age of the single quartering which represents the strict male descent, male upon male. And a simple coat of arms without quarterings may be a great deal more ancient and illustrious than a shield crowded with coat upon coat. And as you can see, the Kunzer coat of arms is, it has no quarterings at all. So according to this, this should be from a direct male line. Now, I continued with my research and I do, my biggest thing is I, I needed to figure out what this symbol was on this shield. And I couldn't tell if it was a linden leaf or even a spearhead. But luckily in his book, I found this one. And I said, oh, that looks like it. And that, is a plowshare. Now, when I shared my findings with Matt and I, I said, I think this is a plowshare, I think it's that farming tool, Matt said, ooh, that's, that would kind of make sense because I, I think there were farmers in my family. I told Rick and Rhonda about my findings and, and then Rhonda said she would send me this book uh, with the Kunzer history and I'm so glad that she did because I got my answers. And it all connected and all made sense after I read through this. So the family, uh, the Kunzer family history in, in this book, it starts with Jos and Hans. The really cool thing about this book is, I mean, History 101, when you do research, you have to check your sources. And luckily in this book, there are multiple different sources that say the same thing about this Jos and Hans and that's when you know that it's legitimate um, their history. They were emigrants. They were in Austria and 
they emigrated over to Switzerland because of uh, the plague of 1434. And every time you hear the plague, it's the plague you're thinking about. It's the it's the Black Death, um, the Black Plague, and the the Black Plague. It it came even after 1352. It it, it came several times and. So they came because of that. Uh, it doesn't mention anywhere if um, they became orphaned because of it or if they were just sent to be sent away to be protected. Not sure, but they were brothers and they were sent away to Switzerland to go live um, with family. So they were brought to their cousins on a farm. And um, so it's really cool because in it, it says through diligence, good behavior and favorable marriages, they became wealthy and they received their first farm and then the much larger farm in Volsenhausen that they bought um, in 1487 for feudal tenor. So feudal tenor, that's a big hint too because that means that the brothers actually owned the land and they had tenants take care of it. So that's where that noble, that gentleman piece of the puzzle comes from is that these brothers uh they weren't knights but they were noblemen and they weren't they weren't it doesn't by the sound of things they weren't born into it it was through their hard work and their favorable marriages that they became noblemen they became gentlemen so that's that's really cool and um, that was something that was a little rare, a little hard during the Middle Ages because it was all about your family and where you came from. But these brothers, it was through their hard work. And they must have been real hard workers because noblemen, they don't marry off their daughters to just anyone. So that's really cool. So these brothers, they owned their own land, they owned their farms, and then they, they kind of went their separate ways. Now, Hans... He only had one son, um, didn't end very well for them, but uh, we'll focus on Jos. So Jos, he left three sons, Casper, Paul, and Hans. Now, Hans had a son named Conrad, and he's the one who built that church. That's their line, that's not our line, that was... Hans's line, uh, his son Conrad, that was through him. We come from Casper. He's our family line. And I knew this because I saw his seal. Does that look familiar or what? So a lot of the times uh, when you had a coat of arms, you also had a seal. And seal, uh, sometimes it, it would be like a ring that you would wear on your finger and every time you would write a letter of an important matter that you didn't want anybody else to read, you would put a wax seal on it. And most of the time that was derived from your coat of arms. And as you can see, his shield is on there. Now when you look through this book, you see multiple different coat of arms, multiple different Kunzler coat of arms. And while those um, are Kunzler coat of arms. They're not our family line's coat of arms. A lot of them are from Paul and um, Hans's side, not us. So I believe that the coat of arms that we have today started off with Casper. He's the one who started off um, as coat of arms. Now with coat of arms, because they became popular, and because um, they wanted to make sure that they were legit, kings would appoint heralds. They're still heralds today. And these heralds, they were the, one who, they were the ones who would appoint them and as well as write a description of what your coat of arms would look like so that then you could take that description and if you needed to make more of your coat of arms, you could take it to different artists and from that description, then they would then be able to draw it out for you. And there are descriptions in this book for the other coat of arms, but there wasn't one for ours. And uh, that, that made me a little worried, but it's okay and you'll see why. Casper Kunzler, he, he moved to St. Margaretin 
and for many years he was according to the book he was a church warden and a farm steward and it, it makes sense that on his coat of arms there's a plowshare because he owned farms and hence the plowshare and it makes sense that the helmet is sideways with the visor closed because he he was not a knight but he was a nobleman he owned land he was a gentleman he married well um and this it's pretty amazing because th this comes from the middle ages it's i mean everything is right there um it's an ancient coat of arms it really is and at the back of the book um a little complicated to understand but there is a pedigree chart and from what I can see there is a direct male line there's a direct male line and so this coat of arms this Kanzer coat of arms it's legitimate and what just what just hit the home run for me is in the book there is a letter the translation is on the previous page before but it's by uh, Fritz Müller. And Fritz Müller, he's, he's a heralder. He's a herald. And he, um, he's a painter and he specializes in family coat of arms. He, he tells the, the history of this Jos and Hans Kanzler. And so unfortunately there's not a date on this, on this letter but this man, because even to this day we have heralds, because these coat of arms, they're passed down from generations to generations. And this herald, is he legitimate the Kanzler line, the Kanzler history? And then uh, about a week ago, I was finally sent um, the picture of the back of the plate, because I really wanted to see that back of the plate, since that can tell us a lot. And as you can see, on the back of the plate, we see him, Fritz Müller from St. Gallen. And that makes it legit. What you guys have is a coat of arms from the late 15th century that has been passed down through a direct male line. It doesn't get more legit than that. It doesn't. This is a true coat of arms from the Middle Ages. And I think that's pretty amazing.